All right, so welcome, everybody. I'm happy to welcome you here. Um, looks like it's a little, <clears throat> a little bit of a sparse turnout this morning because it's so rainy. I appreciate everyone coming in through the rain. Um, so my name is Rebecca Hartman Baker. I am the leader of the user engagement group. Um, and so today I'm going to talk with you all, just give you an overview of NERSC and what we do and sort of how we interact with users and how we expect that users would interact with us. <coughs> so here's my agenda. So I'm going to give you a little introduction to NERSC and who we are, why we're here. Um, talk about the hardware that we have, the software, um, how to interact with NERSC, and then an um, overview of user responsibilities and expectations. Okay, so NERSC stands for the National Energy Research Scientific Computing Center. So that's why we call ourselves NERSC instead of the whole name, right? Too long. So it was established in 1974. It's the first unclassified supercomputer center. Now the original mission of NERSC, and we weren't called NERSC back then, um, was to enable computational science to uh, study magnetically controlled plasma experimentation. So that's why we had NERSC. Um, today, our mission is to accelerate scientific discovery at the DOE Office of Science through high performance computing and extreme data analysis. NERSC is a national user facility, so uh, we have users from all around the country and actually all around the world. So we have more than 7,000 users and 800 projects. Um, and our users use about 600 different codes. We have hundreds of users who are active daily on our machines. Uh, our allocations are primarily controlled by the Department of Energy itself. So 80% goes to what we call ERCAP, Energy Research Computing Allocations Program. That sounds convincing, at least if it's not right. Um, and so we give out, well, they give out uh, about you know, 10,000 to 10 million hour awards. Actually, we have some 100 million hour awards now. Um, users submit a proposal, and then DOE program managers choose from those proposals. So the proposals go to a specific DOE program manager. So if you're, uh, you know, if you're in nuclear physics, let's say, it would go to the nuclear physics program managers. So 80% goes to the ERCAP awards. 10% goes to the DOE Oscar Leadership Computing Challenge, which we also call ALCC, which is an acronym with an acronym. So Oscar, I never can remember what it stands for, but it's like Advanced Scientific Computing Research, I think. Um, and then over the remaining 10% is in our NERSC reserve, and we use that for overhead if, if somebody's if we need to refund somebody's job that didn't run, we use our overhead for that. Um, we use it for education and training. Um, we use it for uh, directors' awards. Uh, for um, Like right now, we have this uh, Scale Science Awards. So that comes through our reserve. OK. So from the DOE point of view, this is how Ooh, I was right. Advanced Scientific Computing Research is Oscar. Go me. Okay. Um, so uh, this is kind of a pie chart of how our allocations were distributed based on last year's distribution of ours. So you can see they go to a wide variety of different areas. Um, so probably some of the biggest ones are BER and BES. So that's um, bi bio biological and environmental research is BER, and BES is basic energy sciences. And so those are kind of broken down into several different sub areas in this pie chart. Um, so you can see we have users from a wide variety of different scientific disciplines that are using our machines. Um, I mentioned before that we have over 600 codes that run. Um, if you look here, um, the top code here is VASP, and VASP accounts for more than 10% of all of the hours that are run on our machines. 
Um, but the top 10 codes make up half of our workload, and then the top 25 codes make up two-thirds of our workload. So while we do have a lot of people from a lot of different areas using our machines, um, and we have more than 600 codes that are being used, really most of our saying, uh, usage is um, in these top 25 codes. Okay, so we are very focused on science. Um, nurse users actually produce and publish more than any other, uh, any other center in the world. We have about 2,000 publications per year that uh, cite NERSC. Um, so, yeah, we actually have uh, probably more publications than any other center in the world as far as we know. Um, so, we love our users and we want to help you all, but we need you to help us to help you. So, if you don't acknowledge NERSC in your publications, then nobody will know how useful NERSC is and then we won't get as much money and then um, we won't be able to provide services to you anymore. So, be sure to acknowledge us in your publications. Also, we love user success stories. So, if you have any user success stories, like really cool publications about your super cool science, then please send, send us your links to your publications. We might even interview you. We could make an article about it. It would be super exciting. It would be a win-win for everyone. So, please, when you use NERSC, acknowledge us and then give us your success stories because we want to hear about it. Okay, so we have a lot of systems here at NERSC. Um, our flagship system is Cori. So Cori is currently in the top 10 of the most powerful supercomputers in the world. Can't remember where we are right now exactly. But uh, Cori has uh, two different types of nodes. So it's got uh, about 2,000 Haswell nodes and about 9,300 9, KNL nodes, and we'll talk more about these later. Um, Edison is our other big machine. Edison has uh, 5,576 nodes, um, and so both of these machines have scratch systems that they are attached to. Um, Edison is also attached to Cori's scratch system, and then Cori, of course, has a burst buffer, which you'll learn more about this afternoon. Um, very neat resource. Uh, so in addition to having our machines there, we've got some clusters. We've got a, a, a cluster called GenePool that houses our PDSF cluster, our AGI resources in there. Um, we've got uh, other resources like visualization and analytics resources. We've got data transfer nodes. We've got science gateways. Um, we're all connected into ESNet. Um, and then also I should mention we have our global file systems, very powerful very large capacity. Um, in particular, something remarkable is our HPSS system, more than 50 petabytes stored on it, uh, 20 years of community data. Um, and so we'll learn more in detail about all of these things as the day progresses. I just wanted to show you sort of a map of how things are all connected here. So w when it comes to our HPC systems, Edison, Edison is great. Edison is a large and stable machine. It, it's not the new hotness anymore. So it has uh, shorter queues than Cori does. And it also has a lower charge factor. We'll talk more about what that means later. But basically it means you can get more CPU hours for cheaper if you go on Edison than if you go on Cori. Now Cori, like I mentioned before, has two different types of nodes. It's got the Haswell nodes and it's got the KNL nodes. So Haswell nodes, these are ideal for throughput. So these are really uh, nodes that we primarily hope that people are using to analyze data or other purposes like that. Um, we, have, we allow single core jobs on those Haswell nodes. And um, we have longer wait time limits for some smaller jobs. Now the KNL nodes, those are really the new hotness. They are the best that we have. Um, they're really good for performance. The issue here is that 
the, the K&L architecture, and I think we'll learn more about this later, the K&L architecture has a lot of very small, low-powered cores, but a lot of them, right? It's got 68 cores per node versus uh, these others that have maybe 32 cores per node. So uh, if you can exploit a many-core architecture like that, then these Cori KNL nodes are perfect for you. And this is where we like people to run all their really large jobs, because remember, we have more than 9,000 nodes of this. So if you can run across 9,000 nodes, that is awesome. That is where we want you to be, okay? So I mentioned before we've got some pretty awesome file systems. So we've got different types of file systems at NERSC. We've got global file <coughs> systems, local file systems, and we have a long-term storage system. So um, we've got a home file system, and it's mounted on all of our machines. So if you log into Edison, you log into Cori, you, you have access to your home directory on both of those machines. Um, it is not tuned to perform well in parallel jobs. So we encourage people to not run your parallel jobs from your home directory. Um, you have a quota on that home directory, and we can't change it. it we, just, we just won't change it. Because that the purpose of home is primarily for storing some data, such as source code or shell scripts, okay, or maybe some binaries, but that's about all that we really want you to use home for, because we've got other file systems that are way better for other purposes that you would be using. So um, in addition, we've got a project space for everyone. So it's mounted also, like home, it's also mounted on all of our platforms. It has medium performance in parallel jobs. Um, we can change the quota there. We can extend your quota. Um, it has a snapshot backup, so it's got a seven-day history, just, just like home did. I forgot to mention that. Um, so what that means is that if, if you accidentally delete a file, you can go back into the snapshot and you can retrieve that file within seven days. And a pro the project system, we really want you to use that for sharing your data within your research group, right, within your project. Okay, then we've got some local file systems. So we've got our scratch file systems. So these are large temporary storage systems. They're, there's a local scratch on Edison, and then Cori scratch, which would normally just be local to Cori, we've also mounted in on Edison. So you can, you can access Cori Scratch from either machine, but you can only access the Edison Scratch file system from Edison. Uh, these are optimized for read-write operations, but not for storage. <coughs> Excuse me. We do not back up the Scratch systems. And in fact, we have a purge policy. So if you leave your data on there for 12 weeks, um, on one system it's eight weeks, on another it's 12. Uh, if you leave it there without doing anything to it, without accessing it, without writing to it, we're gonna de delete it. Um, but Scratch is really perfect for staging your data and performing your computations. That's where we want you to do those things. And then after you're done, you need to clean up after yourself and put, put the output into a more appropriate storage system. Um, so another one is the burst buffer. So a burst buffer is sort of a temporary per job storage, and it's really a high performance file system made out of SSDs. So um, it is really, really, really fast for read-write types of operations. Um, it's only available on Cori. That's one of the unique features of Cori. And it is perfect for getting really good performance from I.O. constrained code. So if your code does a lot of I.O., reading and writing, then you should consider the burst buffer. It would be really good for your performance. And um, this afternoon, we'll have somebody talking more about the burst buffer. Then finally, we've got our HPSS system. So that stands for High Performance Storage System. It is archival storage for e infrequently accessed data. So it is sort of, it's sort of a hierarchical storage system. So on the front, we have this, these high performance disk arrays, and that's kind of where your data goes when it first gets ingested in. But then 
after a while, it hasn't been accessed, it goes into the back end, which is a bunch of tape drives. Now you all may be saying, tape, are you kidding me, Rebecca? Like, why would you use tape? Tape is actually really great. Um, it's really low cost. Um, it doesn't require um, in any electricity or power to maintain it. It just needs to be in a safe environment for tapes. Um, and so that's why we use it. But for more information about HPSS, again, we'll have later presentations. You'll get to learn a lot more about it. Okay, so using NERSC file systems. This is, this is an analogy that I like to use with people. So computing is kind of like baking, right? Like you have these baking ingredients, that's your input. You have this output, which is like a cake. Let's say we're gonna bake a cake, okay? And the computer is kind of like the oven, right? That's where you like, where all the good stuff happens, right? Where you, you're actually taking these strange ingredients, putting them all together, putting them in the oven, and out comes a delicious cake. Okay, so I would liken the home and project systems to your pantry or your fridge, right? That's where you store your ingredients for your baking, right? HPSS is like your freezer. That's where you have like the frozen blueberries or something that you don't use very often, but sometimes you need them so you would bring them out. And then scratch is your kitchen countertop. Okay, that's where you're gonna stage all of your ingredients, you're gonna put them all together, and then you're gonna bake them in the oven, and then you're gonna stage them out onto the countertop again, right? All right, I already said exactly this. <laughs> so when you're baking, you take all of your ingredients out of the pantry, right? And you put them on the countertop, right? You're like, okay, I need my flour. I need my baking soda. You know, I need my buttermilk, whatever. I put them all out on the counter, right? And then I dig into them and I mix them up in my mixing bowl or whatever. Then I put it in my, my cake pan, right? So it's the same thing when you're doing your computations, right? So you've got your data. You need all of this data in order to uh, learn what you're gonna learn from your computations. You put it all in there, you're all ready, you're all set for when it finally runs. Okay, so after baking, you really should clean up after yourself. So in this case, instead of it's your own kitchen and you can attract all the roaches you want and nobody cares, right? Here it's like it's a public kitchen and you need to clean up after yourself because we only have a finite amount of counter space um, and so, you know, somebody else is going to need to use that space. So it's okay to let your cake cool on the kitchen counter, but you need to leave the space clean for the next user, okay? So after a while, if you don't clean up, we'll clean up, but we're not going to clean up in the way that you like. Because what we're going to do is we're just going to get the trash can and we're just going to dump everything into it, and that includes your cake, okay? So don't make that mistake. Don't leave your output on scratch for 12 weeks and expect that it's going to still be there when you come back. Because it won't. Because we'll get rid of it. OK, so let's talk about software. So both of our machines are Cray supercomputers. And their OS is a version of Linux that is optimized by Cray. Now, the machine. On the machine, we provide uh, compilers, three different compiling environments, and we'll learn more about these things in more detail as the day progresses. Uh, we have many libraries that are available, that some of them are provided by Cray, uh, others are provided by us at NERSC, um, and then we also at NERSC, we provide a lot of applications. So we, we compile and support many different software packages for our users. Um, and like I said, there will be more details on this in the later presentations. This is sort of an overview. So um, one big thing that we do is we provide a lot of chemistry and materials applications. Uh, so if you recall, I mentioned that VASP is our number one code that uses more than 10% of the time. Actually, I believe last year it may have been 15% uh, of all of the CPU cycles that were consumed were VASP. So because of that, it's pretty important for us to provide an optimized version of VASP, which is what we do. So, but then there's all these other ones too um, that the chemists use a lot. Okay, so switching gears again, we're gonna talk about how to interact with us at NERSC. So these are three 
primary ways in which you will interact with us. So the first thing is you'll interact with nurse consulting and possibly with the nurse operations folks and then uh, hopefully with the nurse user group. So uh, we ha here's our consulting team. We are composed of people from three different groups. Um, user engagement, that's my group, that's me at the top there, these little tiny pictures. Um, the application performance group and the data science engagement <coughs> group. So we all comprise this consulting team. We all, we all spend time talking to users, answering your tickets, things like that. So in 2017, we handled 7,400 tickets from 2,342 unique users. Okay, so it's a lot of work for us. Um, a lot of different areas that people ask us about. So primarily uh, software and running jobs. Those are our two big ones. Uh, so here is, here's our level of service. So we will, pr we will reply to you within four business hours. If you send in a ticket within four business hours, we'll reply. Uh, we'll help you resolve your problem and we'll keep you apprised of progress. Um, we will attempt to accommodate needs that don't fit within our operating structure. For example, sometimes people require a reservation, so we'll, we'll try to work that in if we can. And we are always happy to get user feedback and constructive criticism. So the only thing we ask in exchange, really, is to, again, help us to help you. Right? Remember, I just said we had 7,400 tickets in a year. So provide us with specifics. What is the problem that you're having? What machine is it on? When did it happen? What modules were loaded? How did you try to fix it or work around it? So if you just send us a, a message and you say, um, my code died. OK, well, what code? Uh, what happened when it died? How did you compile it? You know, what error messages did you get? You know, right? Like, we'll probably reply and we'll ask you all those questions, but it sure would be easier if the first time when you send us a message, you say, I was running VASP and I submitted with this particular uh, input file and here's my, my batch script and I got the following error and it was on Corey, and it was job number such and such, right? If you give us all that information up front, we can help you a lot better than if you just say, my job died. Okay, so we've also got operations staff who are on site all the time, all the time, 24-7, 365 or 366 days per year. Uh, and they supervise the operation of the machine room. They make sure that bad things don't happen to, to these machines, which are worth tens of millions of dollars. So, uh, I mean, they're even there on Christmas. They're even, I mean, they're there on Thanksgiving. They're, de they're there holidays. Uh, they're there at 2 a.m. all the time. So our operations folks, they answer the phone and they will forward it to, con to us consultants during business hours if applicable. So, uh, so you, you might talk to them if you ever call, although I see a lot of young faces around here. I think young people don't like calling, which that's good. Um, I feel the same way. Um, so operations, they know exactly what's going on with the machines though. So they can actually be very helpful with some tasks. So they can help you reset your password, they can help you kill some jobs, they can make limited changes to your reservation if you have a reservation that's running. Uh, so operations, don't discount them and just say, oh, I just want to speak to a consultant. Because operations can really help you out. They're, they're a bunch of smart folks down there. I'm always impressed whenever I talk with them. Okay. Okay, so then we've got the NERSC user group. So this is the community of NERSC users. As I said, we have more than 7,000 users. Um, they're a great source of advice and feedback for us at NERSC, so we ask them their opinions and they tell us. Isn't that great? I mean, there's nothing better than being able to just opine and not having to actually do anything about it, right? And that's what they do. Um, so we've got an executive committee. That's three representatives from each office. So remember the DOE offices that I told you about that, that um, 
that use the machine. So we've got three representatives from each office, and then we also have three members at large. And then um, we also have monthly teleconferences hosted by NERSC, usually on the third Thursday of the month, 11 a.m. to noon. So we already had it last Thursday. It was the third Thursday of the month. Okay. So you as a user, what do we expect out of you? A um, couple of things. So first of all, be kind to your neighbor users, right? Don't abuse the shared resources. So for example, everybody logs into the login node. So don't just go on the login node and just take all the resources and run something that's really computationally or memory intensive on the login nodes. That's not nice. Okay, use your allocation smartly or wisely. Um, we have limited allocations, right? I mean, there's limited time and number of nodes, right? So if you blow through your whole allocation, there's not a lot we can do for you. So use it smartly and don't, don't abuse it. Um, pick the right resource for your job and your data. So small jobs are really great on Corey Haswell. Uh, they're not so good. Well, they're okay on Edison at this point. They're really not so good on the, on the Corey uh, k &L nodes. We're, that's really for the big jobs. Um, so that would be my recommendation. Um, another thing is back, yourself, back your stuff up. So remember, if you leave your cake on scratch for 12 weeks, we'll throw it away. So don't do that. Acknowledge NERSC in your papers so that we can continue to get funding. And be sure to pay attention to security. So don't share your account with other people. Please don't do that. Um, we'll have to disable your account if we find out that you're doing that. So don't do that. It's a bad plan. All right, so thank you. Uh, thanks for listening to me, and welcome to NERSC. I'm really glad you're here. Do we have any questions? Where can you find the slides? Um, we will put them up, right? How are we going to put them up? We'll put them on the training web page. And you also see we're recording, so we're going to have something available on the YouTube, and we'll put the links on the website page as well. Right. Right. Did you hear that? So is that after the training day is done then? Yeah. 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 Slides will be ready soon, but the, the, the videos will need to be post-processed. That will be available. I can then upload when the videos are ready. But you can check the slides uh, later today and tomorrow. Oh, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, yes. Okay. So if you came in, if you didn't come in, in early, um, we've, got, we've got our name tags here. And we'd like you to sign in, and then there's also some refreshments if you'd like to. We do it at the break time. Yeah, you can do it at break time, or you can rush up right now or something. But that's about it. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. So, um, in terms of the uh, files being deleted from Scrap, uh -huh. do they, what does it mean? Uh, like you said, if there's no activity, that it will be deleted. Does that mean, like, if we have it? access the directory that we store everything in, or if you haven't access every individual file? Or okay, that's a really good question. So question was, what did it mean when I said if you haven't accessed your file in 12 weeks? So what this means is, if, so if you, if you read the file, that, that counts. You've accessed it. If you write to the file, that counts. You've accessed it. Um, what other operations can you do to count? Basically, by last, optimum, uh, last access time. What yeah. Whatever way access is. It measures the last <laughs> access. Metadata. 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 So, yeah. Are, okay, yeah, you can change the, the metadata. Access. Yeah. And that means it's been accessed. Yeah. <coughs> well, we purge. We actually left your uh, directory. Directory of never purge. You might see empty directories there, but the files. We purge individual files. We put a dot file in your scratch directory. It's called dot purge dot um, blah blah date. So you go to that date, you'll see all your files listed that being purged on that day. Right. 
this touch um, is considering as an access operation? You know, I didn't want to talk about touch because <laughs> technically, yes, but if we catch you touching, you will ban you. No, it's just yeah. Just, just wanted to make that particularly clear. Yeah, that's why I didn't bring that one up. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other last minute questions here? Otherwise, we'll move on to something way more interesting.